In this first lecture, I want to guide you around in Remix. Remix is an IDE in the browser. So if you open remix.ethereum.org, then you're already ready to start programming in your browser so the files. And in Remix, you have on the left side, you have here your files. So there's a little browser drop down. Uh, when you open it, you have all your files. You probably have just one file at the moment. I have a lot more because I did a lot more in Remix. In the center window on the top, you have your actual editor window. And here you can edit the files, which we'll do in a second. On the bottom, you have the transaction log, which is very, very handy if you are working with Remix and deploy and interact with smart contracts. And on the right side, you have a couple of options here. Uh, here in the, in the compile tab, you have uh, all the warnings and you also have some details about the contract, which we'll gonna look into later. And the most important part for us right now is the run tab. And here you can actually inside Remix, while you're editing your files, you can interact with your smart contracts and you have an environment, and I'm going to select the JavaScript virtual machine environment. That means that if I'm going to deploy my smart contract now, then I'm deploying it in an in-memory blockchain simulation that is running entirely in the browser, uh, completely encapsulated. So uh, you're not going to deploy anything in the real network. And because Remix is in control over this, blockchain that is running in the browser, it also gives you already five accounts with 100 Ether each just to play around. All right, that's it for this first lecture. And in the next one, we are going to remove our smart contract over here. And we are going to start writing our own smart contract. Okay, well, come back in this lecture, I want to remove this smart contract and start creating our own smart contract and deploy it to this JavaScript virtual machine. I'm going to close this file. And uh, what leaves me is an empty space here. Um, I have to create first my file and I'm going to call this the Ethereum course contract dot solve for solidity. And I'm going to be presented with an empty editor window as well. And I have my file over here, browser, the Ethereum course contract dot sol, and I can also find it over here, the Ethereum course contract dot sol. All right, every Solidity file starts with a pragma line and the pragma line is here to let the compiler know for which compiler version the file was actually written for. And this starts with the pragma keyword and then solidity, and then comes in, in semantic versioning, comes the compiler version. And this contract is for compiler version 0424. And that's the current compiler version of solidity. I can see this here in the settings and the current version is 0424. And if this is specifically for this compiler version, so if uh, for whatever reason, a new compiler version is deployed or released, then uh, this pragma line will not let this contract be compiled with a newer or older compiler version. If you want to have it for a different range of compilers, for example, uh, you want to say, okay, this contract should be compilable for all the 0 0.4 versions starting from 0 0.4.24, then you can just add a caret here and it will say, okay, um, compiler version 0424 is uh, okay, 0425 until, but not including 05. So usually what you see on the, on the web are probably semantic versionings like this one, where it says uh, starting from this version going up to 0 0.5, which is then probably a breaking change in the way Solidity is working. After that comes the contract keyword. And the contract keyword tells our Solidity compiler that this is where the contract starts. If you come from Java, this should be very familiar, should be like a class in Java. And then comes in capword style, the name of the contract. It doesn't have to be the same name as the file. In fact, you can have several contracts in one file. And I will just call this one. Uh, 
Ethereum course contract. Then we have curly brackets and we are finished with our first part where we are going to have our contract in our file. Now in this lecture, I want to add some simple variables and I want to start interacting with our contract. Now, in fact, I want to add a variable so that we can write a simple string and then read out the string again. And there are two ways to do that. One is let Solidity generate automatically a getter variable where you can access the string again. But the other one is we write this getter variable ourselves. Now, let's just define a so-called storage variable where we write persistently in storage something uh, when we access this variable in a programmatic way. Now let's say I have a string and I call this string my string and I have one function. A function starts with the keyword function and I call this set my string and I have a string and my string and this function must be public. It doesn't return anything and it sets my string is my string. Now you might have seen that I'm adding here to the function argument a little underscore. The reason for that is that if we are interacting with this smart contract from outside, maybe from JavaScript, then uh, for myself, uh, for projects that I'm doing, sometimes it's very beneficial to see the actual uh, arguments that the contract is expecting versus the arguments that you maybe are working with in JavaScript. So you always have this distinction and there is no collusion, uh, collisions in your code. And the other function is a getter function, which returns our string. And this is also very straightforward. You have a function, get my string. And this function does not receive any arguments, but it gives you back something. It's still a public function and it returns a string. And it returns my string. Now you see, that on the left side here is a little warning. It tells you uh, function state mutability can be restricted to view. And there are two different function modifiers. Let's say where or how this function is accessing storage variables. The one is nothing like in our set my string function. So this would write to storage variables. The other one is view, which would read storage variables, but not modify them. And the third one is pure, which is not accessing any storage variables. Uh, it's just the scope is limited to the function itself or to other pure functions. We have a view function and we have no more warnings on the left side. It's always good to see on the left side what is going on. No warnings. Our compile tab also says our contract is green. No warnings. And now we can actually start interacting with our smart contract. And we are going to do this in the next lecture. Welcome back. And now we are going to interact with our smart contract in this lecture. I'm here in the run tab of Remix and I've selected the JavaScript virtual machine. If JavaScript virtual machine is not selected for you, then please select the JavaScript virtual machine. Now I have selected my first account. I set the gas limit. I just leave it to three, uh, three million gas. I have no value here. I've selected our Ethereum course contract from this drop down, which is this contract here. So if you have several contracts in one file, then you have to select the right contract here. And now I hit deploy. And what happens now are several things. First one is our contract is deployed in the JavaScript virtual machine environment, which we have selected over here on the top drop down. The second thing is in our transaction log window over here on the center bottom, a new transaction pops up. And I can open the transaction details and I see the status of the transaction that it's mined and uh, the execution succeeded. I see the transaction hash. I also see from which account this transaction was started. We're here the from. And I also see that the contract is running under a specific address now. This address is a new address. So the contract is running under its own address, which is a very, very good concept. Uh, very important concept in Ethereum that 
contracts are really running under their own address without any interaction from outside so you don't have to be online or you don't have to have your uh, account somewhere stored the contract is detached from your account running under its own address then we also see the transaction and execution costs so we there's some costs attached when we deploy a contract and the costs are measured in gas and we see the input argument which is the data field in the transaction which is basically the compiled contract code the binary compiled contract code which you can also see here when you go to compile and click on the details then you see uh, a lot of different uh, contract details besides the name metadata and the ABI array and so on you see how in JavaScript you would deploy the smart contract and this would be uh, you create a new transaction and it would have the data field populated and this is the same data field that you have here as input field so you might gonna you, you're gonna recognize a lot if you work with smart contracts you're gonna recognize a lot this 0x60 80 60 40 which is how most of the smart contracts start and this is the same here 60 80 and, and so on so it's just abbreviated all right this was a lot of information but now let's gonna interact with our smart contract we have our deployed contracts over here and when i open this drop down here then i can set my string and get my string and how this exactly works is something we're gonna do in the next lecture well come back and in this lecture we are going to interact with our smart contract and i'm going to show you the difference between transactions and calls i'm also going to talk a little bit about variables here and the reason is variables are initialized by default with the default value so if I'm going to try to access this string, my string here, the storage variable, even though nothing has been set yet, I can still read the values. So it's not initialized. There's nothing written anywhere, but I can still call get my string and it will not give me an error. It will give me an empty string. So very important concept in Ethereum is that all variables are initialized with the default value, no matter if you initialize them manually or not. The second thing is you see here that this one says call and we created a transaction before by creating the course contract and this one says just a check mark uh, vm so the difference is a call is a reading operation and a, a transaction is a writing operation in ethereum and now we are going to set our string and we are going to write here thomas my name and I'm gonna set my string, I had to put this in double quotes. And you see, uh, transact to Ethereum contract, set my string is pending. And then I have the actual transaction. So this is uh, the next important concept in Ethereum. Everything that you do is transaction based. So for every interaction that you do in Ethereum, you start a new transaction. That is either a call transaction, a reading transaction against your local blockchain node, or a writing transaction which has to be mined so if you want to change something on the ethereum blockchain then you need to have the transaction to be baked into the blockchain by a mining node all right now that you uh, see here we clicked on get my string before but it doesn't automatically update so we have to start a new call against our smart contract in order to get the actual content of the string now so now it's thomas and now we see again that this is a call and this is a transaction we can also open the details and have a look so the transaction mind and succeeded and and so on and so forth and here we have no transaction mind and succeeded because there is nothing to be mined if you want to read something the information is already there uh, you don't need to wait for the result uh, to be mined by a blockchain node in the network by a minor node uh, it's instantaneously available all right, in the next lecture, we are going to add a little functionality for our smart contract to receive and send Ether. And then we are going to deploy this on a real blockchain in the Robston test network. Okay, welcome back. And now we are going to do something fun because we have our logic layer, our smart contracts and our economic layer 
our ether on the same network on the same platform we can interact with ether send them around programmatically using our smart contract and that's exactly what we're going to do now we are going to write a function that is able to receive ether do something with those ether and then the ethers are stored in our smart contract and then we are going to send the ether back by calling a function in our smart contract now i'm just going to extend this here uh, the first thing is i'm going to add a variable just to track our balance from a specific um, account and i'm going to use a mapping for this and this mapping is a special data structure in solidity which is very similar to a hash map which can store uh, a specific value to a specific key and it starts with the keyword mapping and then in round brackets you have the, the type of the key everything is static typed in solidity so you have the type of the key and in this case i want to store the type of address to another type called u in and i want to call this my balances so now i can store to a specific address which is a special type in solidity a special data type to a specific i want to store the, the amount of way somebody sends amount of ether somebody sends to a specific address in a mapping called balances and uh, this is the first thing that I wanted to talk about and I want to use here during this lecture. The second thing I want to talk about is a fallback function. A fallback function in Solidity is a function without a name. And this function will be called if you're just sending a transaction without an actual function call, without a data field in our uh, to our smart contract. So that means if somebody is not really interacting with our smart contract, but just sending ether there, then we still have to catch it somehow. Okay, a function, fallback function starts still with the name function, but then there's no name. Instead, there's just the round brackets and it's a public function, doesn't return anything. And what it's gonna do is, what I want it to do is I want to say, okay, there's somebody send, let's say one ether to our smart contract. And I want to have this one ether stored in our balances mapping and for this i want to know who sent this ether and okay how much he sent and to access this information there is a special object a global object available it's called the message object and this message object is everywhere the message and if you want to get the, the person who sent this transaction that will be message sender and if you want to know how much money or how much ether he sent along then it's message value so with these two we know who sent the transaction and how much and now we are going to store these values in our balances mapping so what we're gonna do is we are going to access our balances the message sender add in the value that he sent along and you see again that there is a little uh, exclamation mark on the left warning message value used in a known non-payable function if you want uh, do you want to add the payable modifier to this function and this means that in order to actually receive ether in this function we have to tell solidity that this function is a payable function and to do this uh, very much like this view modifier here we are going to add the payable modifier here at the end of our fallback function so what can we do now no, right now uh, so far we were interacting with our smart contract by really interacting with a specific function that we are having here but if somebody is just sending money to our smart contract it would just get sent back the transaction would be cancelled and the reason is because whoever is going to be the mining node will run through this logic over here for and we'll see okay uh, this 
transaction doesn't specify with which function it want to interact. I don't know what to do. I just going to cancel this transaction. Now in the next lecture, we are going to access our mapping and we are going to write a withdraw function that somebody lets withdraw these ethers again to another address. And then we are trying this. But before we're going to do that, I want to talk about the different denominations in Ethereum, Ether, Way, Gway, Fini, and so on, so that you have a concept of what is going on. In this lecture, I want to talk about the denominations in Ethereum, because there is a big misunderstanding that Ether is the smallest unit on the Ethereum blockchain. Ether is not the smallest unit. In fact, one Ether is 10 to the power of 18 Way. Way is the smallest unit on the Ethereum blockchain. And then followed by uh, Kiloway or Quay, Megaway, Quay, Sabo, Fini, Ether, and then it goes up. And uh, usually when you are working with a Solidity code or with Ethereum on a lower level, then everything is encoded in Way. So every transaction will be sent off in Way. So when you see very, very large values, when you just send one or two Ether around, and you see that the value is suddenly very, very large, then that's because the ether is actually uh, transformed or, or converted into way before it is sent across the network. Now, when you've ever heard about gas costs, then those are usually calculated in Gway, and one gas is usually between one and 100 Gway. So depending how fast you want to have your transaction be uh, mined in a, or baked into a block, the more way you have to actually provide. All right, that's it. What I wanted to talk about in this lecture, keep in mind, one ether is 10 to the power of 18 way. And that's it. Okay, back to our smart contract here, you can see on the right side, even though I have a new function um, in my deployed contracts, my contract on this address, doesn't change. And I have no way to update this contract running under this address, I can now deploy a new contract. And you will see it will get a new address. So our old contract, Ethereum course contract is running at 092, sorry, 0692. And this one is running at 0x0dz, which means it got a new address. And now I have the fallback function here. Uh, this is one uh, properties of the Ethereum blockchain of blockchains in general is immutability. I can't update an old contract anymore. So if I want to update my code running on the specific address, I will get a new address, which also means that the data running under this new address is also empty initially. So now the old address, I still have my Thomas string here, but under my new address, I have nothing yet. Okay, we can also see here that we have our fallback function now. And I could now say, I want to send one ether from this address, I have 99.999 ether. So why is it not 100? Because we have gas costs, a little bit was deducted for gas. Now we have 99. And now I'm going to send one ether to my smart contract. And now I have 98. But now my contract holds this one ether. But I have no way of getting this ether out. I have no programmatic way. And if there is no no logic in our code contract that says, uh, I can withdraw this ether again, the ether is stuck there forever. So I basically just burned one ether on my uh, JavaScript virtual machine. Luckily, it's just a, a simulation in the browser, I can just reload the browser and I have my 100 ether back. That's not what I want to do. I want to write an actual function that says function withdraw ether. So here's what we're going to do. We have a function that has very little logic and it's very simplistic and it's not very secure because now anybody can say, I want the balance from this guy sent to this guy uh, and I want to send him this amount. And then our logic in our code will just check, okay, does this guy from really have this amount? If yes, then send to this address, transfer this amount and transfer is a member of the type of the data type address, address has a couple of members, one of them is transfer, 
The other one is a low level uh, function called send. And there is a huge difference between those two. Send will return a Boolean if the sending was successful or not. Uh, transfer will trigger an exception if the sending is not successful. So if an exception is triggered in the subsequent transaction. So what happens here is if we are going to send, if the two, if the address of two is a normal uh, account, then this is not a problem. They will just receive the ether, fine, done. But if the two is another smart contract, and let's say we are going to transfer this to another smart contract, which doesn't have a fallback function or which has a fallback function, which is not payable, then this will trigger an exception. So here's what's gonna happen. With transfer, this exception is cascaded into our smart contract and our transaction is aborted. With uh, send, we have, uh, we have a transaction and it's just returned false, but our transaction is not aborted. So I'm going to prefer transfer for this. And we are going to try if we can actually transfer and withdraw Ether now from an address to an address and a specific amount. Obviously, this is not secure. And if you paid attention to how this logic is built up, you will hopefully think that I'm crazy to do this. And you will hopefully have a lot of ideas how to make this better. Now in the next lecture, we are going to try and deploy our smart contract, send some ether to our smart contract, and then withdraw the ethers again. Okay, let me deploy our smart contract. I have the new instance here. Now I have four functions, my two functions, set my string, get my string, my fallback function and my withdraw ether. Here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to take my first account and I'm going to send one ether to my fallback function. As you can see here, if I open this transaction, I see that I have a value of 10 to the power of 18 way. So now my contract holds one ether and can uh, control one ether. And now I can say, I go to my second account and I actually, I need to first copy the first account. So from, I need to put this in quotes to this account and then one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. So zero point one ether, and we can see that, or maybe I had zero point zero one ether. Now I suddenly have uh, zero point zero one ether more in my second account, e a little bit less because of the gas cost that occurred during this transaction, and. I see here the input that I sent to my smart contract and I basically withdraw from my smart contract 0 0.01 ether to my second account. All right, now that we have some logic in our smart contract, you probably can think of a lot more to do. And the last thing that I wanna show you in this course is how you can get this on the actual blockchain. So in the next lecture, we are going to install and configure MetaMask. And then we are going to get some test ether on the Robston testnet. And then we are deploying our smart contract. And then we are going to interact with the smart contract with a wallet. Okay, I'm here on the website MetaMask.io. And MetaMask is a browser plugin for all the major browsers. In this case, I'm here on the Chrome browser and I'm going to get the Chrome extension for my Chrome browser. I'm gonna hit add to Chrome and I say, yes, I want to add the extension to my Chrome browser. I'm going to download the extension. And it's going to open another site. And then I have the extension here on the top right corner of my browser window. And when I hit click it, then it should open the extension and say, yes, there's a new version of MetaMask. I'm gonna try it now. 
and it's a full page version. And I can start to set up my MetaMask plugin, which we are going to do in the next lecture. So in order to set up MetaMask, we first have to create a password. And the password, I just choose a simple password for me. This is to unlock MetaMask if somebody else is using your computer or uh, you just leave your computer alone. Just have your MetaMask locked in order that nobody can access your accounts. Then I create the password. And I don't need a unique image. And I just accept the terms of use, the privacy notings, the phishing warning. And now I have to back up a, a seed phrase. And this seed phrase is here in order if I lose or my computer crashes, then I can use this seed phrase to restore all my accounts in MetaMask. This seed phrase is very important that you are not giving it out. You're not posting it anywhere. Just write it down on a piece of paper and store it somewhere safe. This is the access to all of your funds stored on the accounts that are stored in MetaMask. So this is really important that you, you understand this. This seed phrase makes it easy to restore MetaMask with all your accounts. So if you give this out, then anybody else can restore your accounts and, and access your funds. So don't give it out. Don't do what I do. I just copy this for me. And then uh, once you have written it down, you have to confirm your seed phrase. Okay, once you have confirmed the seed phrase, especially the order of each word, then you hit confirm. And then you're greeted with this uh, pop up, which I don't want to do now. I even close this page, I close this page and this and this too, and I go back to Rem Remix. And in the next lecture, I'm going to show you how you can actually get some test ether for the Robston test network. And then I'm going to, need to show you how you can deploy your smart contract on the Robston testnet. Okay, welcome back. Now let's get started by getting some actual test ether. I have here my MetaMask plugin. And if you open it, you see um, a lot of details here. The first one is you are on the main Ethereum network. And this is a drop down. So you can select different other networks. And for our use case here, I'm going to select the Robston test network. The second thing is you see that you have selected account number one. And if you click it, you can actually copy the values to clipboard. You see the address here. You can always create new accounts, either uh, importing a private key, uh, connecting to a hardware wallet, or just create a new private key based on the seed phrase that we had in the last lecture. So the seed phrase is going to be pushed through a specific algorithm, and this creates your new account. So based on the seed phrase, you can always create these accounts that you create here in MetaMask. All right, so we have our Robston test network selected. And the next thing that you want to do is you want to hit deposit. And that brings up this little pop up here. So either you can directly deposit Ether or you open the test faucet. And I'm going to hit get Ether from the test faucet. And this will open the faucet.metamask.org. And in our case, these are free ether. These free ethers on the test networks are here to give you the opportunity to test your smart contracts or test the behavior of your smart contracts or of whatever you want to do on the blockchain with a real blockchain environment. You remember here when we were in Remix, in Remix, when we hit the deploy button, then everything is instantaneously here. But on a real blockchain, these transactions that have to be mined take time. And you're going to see that now, if you hit request one ether from faucet, then it will take some time until first of all, the transaction is here. And once this transaction is finally here, you can see that it takes time until this transaction is really successfully mined and baked in a block. Now, let me show you in MetaMask that you still have zero ether here. Okay, I hit request one ether from faucet only one time. And if you uh, click on if you click it a couple of times, then you will get a lot more ether. Then you can open uh, this menu over here. And then you say details. And then you can click on view account on ether scan and view account on ether scan will open a so called block explorer. And 
a block explorer is here to show you what is going on with a specific address. So everything on the Ethereum blockchain or on a public blockchain like Ethereum is public. So you can see the transactions, you can see the data, you can see who sent whom, how many Ether, or who interacted with which smart contract when, and that's all public and is uh, auditable in a, in a way back until the first block. So since the first block of Ethereum, you can go back at any point in time and see who did what on the Ethereum blockchain. And that's a very, very important concept of Ethereum. All the information is public. That means I can go to a website like robson.etherscan.io and they have Ethereum nodes running in the background which are getting the same information as all the other Ethereum nodes. And they are just parsing this information and putting it in, in a database and then showing it you beautifully via this uh, website. Okay, this might have not worked now. In this case, I just really click one more request, one Ether from Fawcett, and it should hopefully bring up a transaction here. I can see it. And now I just reload this page. And I see that there is a transaction pending uh, four seconds ago from the faucet address to my address, one Ether. And once this is done, and this takes time uh, until this transaction is actually mined, a new block is generated on the Ethereum blockchain every 10 to 20 seconds around, I think it's around 14 seconds on average. And uh, once this time passed and, and we have our transaction in our block, then the ethers will actually pop up here in MetaMask. Now we see that the ethers are here. Okay, now we see that we have a balance of one ether over here. If I open this uh, specific transaction, then I see that the received status is success. Okay, now that we have actual Ether here, how we can we put our smart contract that we have in Remix onto this Robston test network? Right now, we are just working with the Ethereum virtual machine here in our Remix IDE. Now, that's well, something that we're going to do in the next lecture. So stay tuned and I'll see you in the next lecture. In this lecture, I'm going to show you how you can deploy your smart contract that we have here in Remix via MetaMask into the Robson test network and then interact with your smart contract from any other browser. Now, the first thing that I'm going to do is I just remove all of these deployed contracts and I'm going to change my environment to injected web free. What does that mean? Now, let me reload the whole page. And injected web free means that if your if you have MetaMask installed, then MetaMask will automatically attach a web free object to the window, to the browser window. So in terms of JavaScript, means that there is a web free in, in a window object available. If I open the, the console and I type in web free, then you can see that there is a web free already existing. And this means injected web free. MetaMask will inject the web free object. They're going to change this in the future, maybe. But right now, still, they're going to inject the web free object directly into the browser window. And that way, you can access this MetaMask plugin from your browser window. And you can see already here that I have only one account available now in Meta in Remix. And this says one Ether. I can also see that I'm connected to the Robson test network with the network ID free. Every network has a network ID, and Robson has the network ID free. And now what's going to happen if I hit deploy, then you remember in, in the past, we had instantaneously a transaction here and instantaneously also there was a new deployed contract instance available here under deployed contracts. Now, what is going to happen if I hit deploy now? Hit deploy. It says creation of Ethereum contract pending, but MetaMask will open with a notification and say, Hey, there is a contract deployment. Are you sure that you want to do this? Because it will cost you something. So every time you start a real transaction with MetaMask, MetaMask will open a notification and will ask you for confirmation. And that's a, a very 
very important concept of how MetaMask is working. It will give you access to the blockchain in, uh, directly from your browser. And every time you want to write something, every time you need access to your private keys from these stored accounts, it will open a notification. If you want to read something, reading operations doesn't cost anything. There is no notification. So let's say I hit confirm. And what's going to happen next is that I have a new transaction hash and I need to wait until this transaction is mined on the network before I can actually access my smart contract. So if I, if I hit this uh, link to the Robson Etherscan.io website, then I see that the transaction is pending until it's finally successful. And when I go back to my Remix now, then I see I have now my transaction is successful, little check mark here, and my deployed contracts uh, contract is available here on the on, on the my deployed contract section. I still have my same functions. I can get my string is immediately available. But if I want to set my string to Thomas, then this is a writing transaction. MetaMask will open a pop up again. I need to confirm this. It will give me a new uh, Robston Etherscan IO link. Okay, now this transaction that we started earlier is mined. And if I access get my string now, then my string is available. Again, reading operations instantaneously, writing operations take time. Now in the next lecture, we are going to transfer uh, half an Ether or 0.1 Ether from our account here in MetaMask to our smart contract. And then we are going to do something else. We are not going to withdraw it immediately. We are going to another website and we are going to interact with our smart contract from JavaScript HTML directly to the blockchain again via MetaMask. All right, in this lecture, I want to transfer 0.1 Ether to our smart contract and then withdraw the Ethers again with my Ether wallet, which is a website also running in the browser. And I'm going to do this with a different browser without MetaMask. So I'm um, here. Still in my Remix, I have my deployed contract instance running on the Robston test network. And I select Ether 0 .1, 0 0.1 Ether. And I'm going to hit the fallback function button so that I'm going to interact with the fallback function. MetaMask tells me that my transaction cost me something. Obviously, it's only test Ether on the Robston test network, so it doesn't really cost anything. But if it was on the real network, then it would cost me around $22.68. Also, there are gas fees attached. So at the end, I'm going to pay $22.69. Yes, I'm going to confirm this. And we're going to have a transaction hash, which we need to wait until it's mined. So let's wait a little bit until this is mined. OK, the transaction is mined. And we have sent 0.1 Ether to our contract. And now what we're going to do is we want to call this withdraw ether function, but uh, we want to do it not directly from our Remix, which is obviously how this is working. I want to show you how you can interact with any smart contract from a website called my ether wallet, which is a wallet website. I'm going to open my Firefox browser for this. I go to myetherwallet.com and there is a pop up which I'm going to close and here, I, I don't have any MetaMask uh, plugin installed here. So what I'm going to do is I use my Ether wallet, which has also access to the blockchain via a company called Infura or via their own uh, servers so that they have some Ethereum nodes running in the background. And I want to uh, access the Robston test network from my etherwallet.com over here in this drop down. I click away the pop up and I go to the contracts section. And in this case, I'm going to interact with my smart contract. So I need a contract address and an ABI interface. What is this? The contract address is very obvious. The contract address is the address where the contract is running on. But what is the ABI interface? The ABI interface stands for application binary interface It's a JSON interface. JSON encoded uh, information, how to interact with this smart contract. Now, when we have a look in Remix, and if you remember back uh, when we created the smart contract, then 
uh, the input is just this uh, hex coded binary input. So the contract code gets compiled. Uh, if I hit on the details, uh, you just see these opcodes here. So this is basically what the uh, Ethereum nodes are executing. And once the contract is compiled, there is no way to know how to interact with this contract. So there's the, the Ethereum node or whoever starts the transaction must know how this, uh, how this function is called and which input arguments or which return uh, parameters the functions are providing or, or which arguments they need. And it's not about which arguments, it's about the data type they need. So all these data types must be encoded in a very specific way. And that's done with the ABI array. This ABI array tells um, our MyEther wallet how to encode uh, whatever we're going to send in. And this says, for example, I have the ABI array here. There are several, there are these four functions that we have here. And the first one says the name is set my string and it has one input argument, name is my string and the type is string. And it has a fallback function and then it has a withdraw ether function which has inputs. Uh, one input argument is address, the next one is address, and the third one is a u in 256. And then we have get my string, and this has outputs, which is a string. So in order to interact with the smart contract, you need this ABI array. Where do you get this ABI array from? When the contract is compiled, the compiler tells you this ABI array. In our case, the compiler is in directly in baked in our Remix. And if I hit the details and I go to a little bit further down, I see the ABI here and I can copy this. I can just click here on the, this little icon and I say copy to clipboard. Then I can go to my Ether wallet and I can paste the ABI here. Now still I need the address. Where do I get the address from? I go to the run tab and I see here the deployed contracts and here I have a little copy, to, copy value to clipboard icon so I can copy the address to clipboard. I go back to my ether wallet, paste this and I say access. Then I can read or write the contract. Now, if I want to withdraw ether, then I need, I, I need to provide obviously the arguments that this function needs, but I also need a way to how to access this, uh, my wallet. Where can I get my private keys for in order to start this transaction. So let's say, first of all, I want to say from my account that I, I sent the ethers to, so I have it in my mapping here. Then I want to send it um, to my second account in MetaMask, which I maybe created earlier. Now let's create a new account. Copy the address here. Paste this here, and I want to send 0 0.1 ether. That's uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18. And in my case, I'm going to enter my seed phrase, which is not recommended. And the seed phrase comes in this case from a MetaMask wallet which lets me recreate my private keys and my accounts directly in my Ether wallet. So I'm going to unlock this one here. I'm going to choose the uh, HD path and I'm going to access my first account with the 0 0.899 and so on Robson Ether. All right, and now I'm going to write this transaction. I generate a transaction. Yes, I'm sure I want to make this transaction. Okay, now I've broadcasted a transaction to the network. And how did this work? I used my seed phrase from MetaMask in order to recreate my private keys that create my account. So all starts with the private key. The, from the private key, a public key is derived. And from the public key, an address is derived. And the, the private key is necessary in order to sign a transaction. 
And this is the starting point. This is the, the main point that you should never give out. That's the private key. Now this seed phrase generates all your private keys. Now guess what? You should never give out this seed phrase. So this is really just for testing purposes. Okay, let's check. Uh, let's go back to Remix and let's see if we have our 0 0.01 Ether here in our second account. And we have. That's it for this course. Uh, thanks so much for watching. Now, obviously, this is just the beginning of the blockchain journey. Have a look at the following courses in the link below. And I would love to see you in the next courses as well. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you in the next courses.